first sessions uh, of the Agincourt Core 600 uh, conference, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker. There's a slight change because speaker one <coughs> is stuck in traffic on the M3, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to do it. Uh, so number uh, David is, is kindly agreed to go first. Uh, David's currently doing a master's degree at Portsmouth University, and he's been using the medieval soldier database uh, to do a comparison and looking at the 1415 and the 1417 campaigns of Henry V. Uh, so, David, it's over to you. If, you. if you want to, if you just press enter on there. Okay. Click, the Brilliant. Uh, Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm currently doing an MA at Portsmouth, uh, did a degree in Chichester, which I finished a couple of years ago, and the presentation that I'll show you basically comes from, <coughs> from the research that I did for a dissertation at Chichester. Um, what I'll talk you through is a bit of the background to the research. Um, I'll very briefly talk about the soldier in later medieval England database. I'll talk a bit about the military changes that went on during this period, the approach that I took to the research and the findings running through the patterns of service in the campaigns and focusing particularly on the knights and the archers and evidence of family units. Now when I did the research I also looked at barons and their role in the two campaigns and also gunners, um, artillery use. I probably won't have time to talk about those today though. And then lastly some conclusions. So, I think before I go any further, I ought to make clear that I wasn't actually part of the team that compiled that database. Um, I, that was done before I returned to academia, so if there isn't anyone here who was involved in that, and I get anything wrong as I go through it, apologies, please correct me gently at the end. Um, it's called Medieval Soldier Database. There are actually three separate databases. The Muster Rolls Database, the Protection Database, and the Garrison Database. It was written using Microsoft Access technology, and there is a public front end, which I suspect many of you are familiar with. The Muster Rolls Database covers 1369 to 1453, and it's primarily, as the name suggests, taken from the Muster Rolls, which records what soldiers were present <coughs> at a particular muster, and therefore what expeditions. The protection database records participants who were seeking protection from prosecution while serving the Crown abroad, and they come from the plea and the pardon rules. <coughs> and they have to be used a bit more carefully, um, in as much as you could seek protection, you could be granted it, it didn't guarantee you went. Um, and in fact, there are a number of instances where people didn't go and it was revoked. And indeed, here's an example of one from the 1415 campaign where a certain John Liffin has had his exemption from prosecution revoked because he's tarrying along in Northampton, basically, and hasn't gone anywhere. The final database is the Garrison database. Um, that has details of, of soldiers at the Normandy garrisons and comes from French repositories and covers 1415 to 53. All of these databases contain the names of the individuals, the rank, were they a man at arms, were they an archer, and their status, the year, and possibly other information as well, depending on the database. So, a little bit about the background of what was happening at the time. The feudal system, where service was due for the right to hold land, had ended. The last feudal levy was actually in 1385 against the Scots. And it had been replaced by a system of contracts and payments. Usually the king would contract against a lord or a knight to provide a certain level of resources. And they'd be paid for that resource. And then when the, the force was assembled, a muster roll was taken. And this is where the muster rolls come from. And this is why they are, as far as they can be, they're accurate, because they were being recorded for payment. There's been a long debate also around experience and professionalisation around this time. 
amongst the, the soldiers. Um, Powick, I think, probably started the debate when he, he actually looked at the 1417 campaign, looked at the commanders who served there, looked, how, looked at how many of them served in 1415, and found that only 17.5% of them did. And he concluded from that that there may well have been a problem with lack of experience. But that has very much been debated since. So, this time, 1415 to 1417, was a pivotal point in terms of English strategy. Agincourt is, can probably be considered the last of the Chevrochet expeditions, where there was no attempt to hold land, really. It was essentially going abroad, seeking battle, trying to force the French to negotiate, and then returning. <coughs> 1417 was very much a change. It was conquest, retention of territory, and an attempt to populate the land with English. The French weren't necessarily expelled in captured territory. If they swore an oath of fealty, they were allowed to remain. But if not, they were expelled and their possessions were given away. Gradually, levels of, of integration and fraternisation happened. Um, as it says there, initially the law prevented marriage to the French, but this was changed very rapidly. And just one particular case, quite a well-known one, John Converse. On the 30th of September 1417, ten days after the fall of Caen, Henry V gave him permission to marry the daughter of Richard Cornet of Caen, who was a Frenchman. He also gave him Cornet's property, um, which I suspect may not have been too popular with him. Um, and when one talks about long term and staying there long term, in 1450, John Cornet's son was still actually present in Caen. It's a period of technological change as well, um, particularly around artillery. That was becoming increasingly important in both of these campaigns. And one shouldn't forget that there are actually similarities when we compare the campaigns. The king accompanied both campaigns. Both of them were to northern France. And actually, even though 1417 was one of conquest, <coughs> the initial indentures were for a year. They were expecting people to serve for a year. Very quickly, the approach that I took. Um, I was kindly given the entire medieval soldier database. I stripped out the data in the first instance that, that didn't relate to 14, 15 and 17 and intended to create a new database. But actually I found that I could do what I wanted with the native features in both Excel and Microsoft Access and by moving things to and fro. Both of them are built on tables and they both offer automated features. So I was do things using a lot of, of automated access. Having said all of that, there was also a lot of manual inspection involved, and occasionally I did have to go back to the full data. Um, I suppose a little word of warning about, about names and deciding who is the same individual, because um, I fell into the trap <laughs> very early on, luckily. Um, to be fair, a number of people do warn that you cannot assume that just because someone has the same name in these databases, it's the same individual. Um, I started out comparing the 1415 and 1417 using both first name and surname and thought, two years apart, you may not be certain for each one, but statistically you could probably derive something from it. Um, so I did that. And between 1415 and 1417, there are nearly 5,000 duplicate names, and my initial reaction was, ooh, that's a lot of the same people going. Um, fortunately, I then thought, well, what about if I just look within 1415, and what if I just look within 1417? And actually, there's a hell of a lot of duplication within those as well. So, I mean, the real conclusion that I came to is that just using names is very unreliable. There needs to be other means of confirmation whether it's rank, who they're associated with, or, or other ways of tracking, but, but one needs to try and get some other form of confirmation. Okay. Um, I've already mentioned Powick. He, uh, he looked at 1415 and 1417 and um, concluded that 
there may may be a problem with uh, experience, given that seventeen and a half percent of fourteen seventeen commanders served in fourteen fifteen. I had the luxury of having this database, so I managed to look back further, not just at 1415, but earlier campaigns, and I was fairly strict in terms of, of what I took to be the same individual, so not just names. Um, and looking back at other earlier campaigns, the figures that I came up with is at least 43% of those who served in 1417 did actually serve in other campaigns. Not 1415, but, but they had military service somewhere else. And I think the actual number is likely to be to be a bit higher simply because I've, I've ruled some out. Moving on, um, focusing particularly on knights. Now, over the period of the Hundred Years' War, the number of knights declined, especially actually fighting knights as opposed to those who were, who were doing administrative duties. Within this period, they generally performed at men-at-arms, but with a higher rate of pay, though some of them were actually leaders of retinues. Knights, at this time, fall, fell into two categories, Knights Banneret and Knights Bachelor. Um, knights Banneret in the 14th century at least, had been responsible for organising mounted forces and indeed could give orders to other knights. But by the time of Agincourt, it had lost almost all of its significance, both military and social. And there are four banneret knights who are listed at Agincourt. There are none listed in 1417. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean none were present. It may just be that, frankly, no one thought it worth recording by that stage. And then the title was finally abolished in 1640. Um, okay, so a couple of graphs showing the knights in 1415 and 1417. Um, a couple of interesting sort of stats, really, I think. I mean, having said what I've said about... Um, the commanders having lots of previous service. If you look at 1415, the number of knights there <coughs> who actually had service before were only nine, or at least certainly that's the number that I could find. So it's, it's probably an underestimate, but, but it's certainly not a large number. Can I ask a question? Yeah? Are those people who were knights going into the campaign or were knighted? They were going into the campaign. Yeah. yeah. Um, much higher figure for 1417. Um, don't know why, to be honest, but a much higher figure. Um, if you look at service in garrisons, 1450, only three went on to serve in garrisons. Only 1417, a much higher number, still only 10. Um, but that, I think, you know, is to be expected because 1417 really was the start of a large number of garrisons being established in France. Um, although the number of knights serving was declining, it's certainly been argued by some that, that those that did serve often served for longer. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about John Cornwall simply because he provides a, a good example of both some of the long service of knights but also because it shows some of the problems actually in using the database which I have to say I think is a wonderful database so when I talk about problems I did love it. <coughs> Couldn't have done this without it. Um, John Cornwall had a career of 37 years. Um, he fought against the Irish for Richard II he also fought in Scotland and Wales. He was at Agincourt. Um, he was there in 1417 in the expedition to France. And then in 1420, he ambushed and wiped out a joint French and Scottish force. He also appears in the muster roll for 1421. But unfortunately for him, it was a personal tragedy. Um, he was there with his son, 
who was decapitated in front of him by a stone cannonball, which actually also injured John. Um, so not a good outcome, and from memory, it's, I haven't got it in the presentation, I think he then said that he wouldn't fight against Christians anymore. It's a good example because it it shows that his you know his son was there. It shows the importance of familial bonds. It shows him repeating service over and over again. I mean, he was very much a military man. But the analysis from the from the the database and from the roles is quite difficult because both his son and his father were also called John Cornwall. And then when you go into the rules, there are different ways of spelling Cornwall, um, which is a consistent problem with the rules, really. Um, you know, they were compiled by scribes and someone telling them their name, and then the scribe would write it down. No one was going to spell the name. You'd get a different scribe the next time someone appeared. So it was always down to interpretation as to, as to, as to a spelling. <coughs> OK, a little bit about the archers. Um, they're of lower status than the men-at-arms. And, and in the roles, if their status is given, it's, it's almost always that of yeoman. They were, however, the most populous rank within the 15th century armies. They could be mounted or foot, but they always fought on foot. And the mounted archer had come to predominate. 1415... Certainly as far as the evidence in the muster rolls is concerned, 7.1%, only 7.1% of archers were listed as foot archers. By 1417, that's down to an even lower figure of just 0.1% of the archers. But I think, as with a lot of these things, there has to be a degree of caution because there is quite a large number of archers that, that just aren't listed as foot or mounted, so you can't always be sure. But certainly the evidence suggests that they were declining still further than the, the foot archers. Ratio of men at arms to archers at this time, usually about one to three. Um, and that ratio goes up through the, the 15th century. 1415, it's one to 2.87. 1417, it's gone up yet further, one to 3.33. I looked in particular at the Cheshire, Cheshire archers. Um, they were very much a specialist unit. They weren't mixed with men at arms, um, as was often the case, or the normal case, and they were very much an elite force. They were also recruited directly by the Crown's local officers. Fourteen fifteen, an interesting example of, of just how. You, you know, in spite of the muster rolls, you can never really be certain what's going on. The archers were paid by William Troutbeck, Chamberlain, um, and his accounts show payments for 247 archers. <coughs> Nicholas quotes Ryan as stating that Troutbeck was contracted to supply 650. So maybe he didn't supply 650, maybe there were only 247, that's why the 247 were paid. But the rolls show 196. Possibly there's some missing roles. There are some missing roles. Um, who knows? But certainly there are three different figures there. 1417, um, much larger force on the surface of it anyway. Um, 405 appear in the muster rolls. Only 20 archers of the Cheshire archers went to serve in the 1417 campaign here in the 1415 campaign. So, so slightly more than 10% of the 1415 archers if we take the muster roll figures. What I found interesting was that out of those 20 archers, there are a number of clusterings where the names all appear together in the 1417 rolls. And there, <coughs> there has to be some reason for that, I think. Um, you know, were they standing together because they were friends? Were they standing together when the roles were taken because they served together before? Did they all know each other? Um, and I think it's an example of the positionality in the muster roles containing information. And there are other examples of that. Um, Anne Curry identified that three men-at-arms who were knighted after the Battle of Agincourt 
John Calthrop, Harry Strange, and Thomas Janey occupy positions two, three, and four on the master role of Sir Thomas Erpingham. And again, that is so unlikely to be con <coughs> coincidence. Were they the most highly regarded? Were they the best? Don't know. Did they all know each other? Because they were the best names stood together. Who knows? But, but clearly there's a reason why the three of them appear in the same you know, positions, two, three, and four. Um, and I think, personally, that is an area that, that more research could be done in the roles. Is there more positional information in there that hides, hides things? Family groups. Um, 1417 was a colonising expedition, and therefore, <coughs> I reasoned, um, there was more likely to be family groups participating. I struggled to come up with a, a means of measuring this. Um, in the end, I attempted to do it through looking at where people had the same surname and there was a senior and a junior and they appear in the same muster so basically people same name senior and junior appearing in the same muster and that I think almost certainly means they are related in some way not necessarily father and son but they're related in some way interestingly most of the, the instances where that happens they also actually appear adjacent to each other in the roles so again it's a it's an indication of positionality showing <coughs> something 1415 there were seven instances 1417 20 instances so an increase of 186 percent so i think that indicates i won't phrase it any more strongly than that indicates that that, that theory is correct and that's what's happening the reason why I'm cautious about it is, given the number of people who went, that's still a very small number of individuals to base anything on, really. But it, it certainly was the direction that I expected it to be. <coughs> I'm pretty close to the end, so I'll very quickly just, just talk about this. Um, <coughs> in, the, uh, in the analysis of the, of the, of the roles in the database... Um, I found two roles that were almost identical, one of which was, um, as far as the database was concerned, was marked as, marked as a sick role, and the other one, basically, there was, there was a sort of, we're not sure where this came from, was the annotation. Um, I went back to the, to the National Archives and found them dug them out. They both appear to be sick roles. What's interesting about them, though, is I thought they were, they were almost identical. Not absolutely identical, but almost identical. One of them had an extra two or three names, and had different spellings for some people who were at risk of contradicting what I said before, were almost certainly the same individuals, so they'd probably been taken by a different scribe. Um, don't really know why that would be. It sort of indicates to me that possibly someone wasn't happy with the first count and did a second count a day or two later or something, but it's so they're virtually identical um, and... That's what basically what sort of the, the top of the master <coughs> rolls look like for you, those of you who haven't seen them at all. Um, and at the bottom, there's a leather bag that's that's still at the National Archives that contains six of the rolls. Uh, so, finally, then, just to conclude, um, 1417 campaign. Uh, certainly, the evidence from the database suggests that 43% of the commanders served in earlier campaigns. Um, which suggests certainly as far as the commanders are concerned that experience is an issue the figure is also similar for knights actually um, I didn't mention that in the graphs we went through 41% of the knights in the 1417 campaign had served before but interestingly few of them went and then went on to serve in later cam campaigns there's the indication that, that the change from Chevrochet to Pays de Coquette Increased the familiarity of groupings of those servings. And lastly, as I've said, I found patterns of the sequencing of names in the muster rolls that I think contain hidden information. Um, and I think it would be good if someone somewhere did some more digging on that. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention.